And we came to the conclusion that Paul's conclusion is all Jews and Gentiles are guilty before God. So that's the final conclusion of it. And so then he concludes with a really important verse in Romans 3 verse 19. And if you'll follow along, please. Now we know. Paul's always saying that over and over again. We know something. We know something. We know something. So here he says, For we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them that are under the law that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Now in a sense that seems like a contradiction. Because think of what he's saying, because who was the law given to? to Only to Israel. So why would it be saying, now, to, for we know that whatsoever the law saith, it saith to them that under law that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Remember I said that a lot of people have no knowledge of why the law was given. If you would talk to most people, and please, I'm not trying to put people down, but people who have not studied the Word of God or know it, if you'd say, when was the law given? Well, some people say, well, I think it was given to mankind in the beginning. To Adam and all of us, the law was given so that we could, you know, it was given to us to understand what good and bad is. Well, we know that's not true. How do we know that? Go to John 1.17. And if somebody will read that, please. For the law was given by Moses. But grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Okay, so we have the answer very clearly. The law was what? Given, Given to Moses. So then a lot of people would say, well, wasn't Abraham under God's chosen? Yeah, so, but we know from that statement then, it wasn't even given to Abraham. It wasn't given to Isaac. It wasn't given to Jacob. It was given to Moses. And remember in another, another study that we did, why was the law given? What was the important thing that the law was given to Israel to do? So they could go in and do what? Possess the land. Because remember, they went into Egypt as a family. They come out of Egypt as a nation. They were born at Dren. That was the first time we're born. When he says to Nicodemus, Nicodemus, I say unto you, that I say unto thee, Nicodemus, singular, ye, who the nation Israel must be born again. And they will be born in a day according to Isaiah 66. So it was given to Israel for a purpose that they could go in and possess the land. The law is the righteousness, or we might say the rightness of God. So there's nothing wrong with the law. It is perfect. The problem with the law is man. We are a sinner. Okay? How many sins does it take to be a sinner? One. And who committed that first sin? God didn't say, well, Adam, that's only one. So I'm going to forgive that one. And if, if you don't do it again, I'll keep you in line. No, it took God, Adam out of the presence of God. He was taken out of the Garden of Eden, a place where he communicated directly and walked with God, and he was taken out of that. Now he was redeemed, and he was redeemed by blood. Because remember what God had to do, he went and shed the animal, took their skins and covered Adam and Eve with the skin, showing that it's always a blood message. But he still had to be punished for what he did, and they were taken out of the Garden, okay? So that's the second thing. The other thing that most men, uh, people believe is the law is given to everyone. Well, go to Deuteronomy chapter 5 and verses 2 and 3. If you would talk to most people say, well, the law was given to all of us. Well, Deuteronomy 5, 2 and 3 makes it very clear who was given. It was a covenant between God and the nation Israel. A covenant between God and the nation Israel. And if somebody would read that, please. The Lord our God made a covenant with us in Horeb. The Lord made not this covenant with our fathers, but with us, even us, who are all of us here alive this day. So Moses says, it wasn't even given to Abraham and I, was it? It was given only to us today. And what are they being prepared to do? 
to go into the land. It is so beautiful when we just take God at his word. See, as I keep saying to him, faith is simply believing, and believing is simply taking God at his word. So let's go back to Romans now. So what could it mean then if the law was only given to them, but then he says that every mouth may be stopped? Well, that's why we have, that's why we have Romans, and I want to apologize to everybody. So you can change that in your notes. This was not to say Genesis. I'm getting old. This was to be Romans. Romans 1 through 3. And I apologize. So in Romans 1 through 3, why is already declared in Romans 1 what? Gentiles to be guilty before God. So what he's really saying is, I've already proven to you in Genesis 1 that the Gentiles are guilty. He gave them over, he gave them over, he gave them up. So now what he's saying is, now I'm going to put the Jews in that same situation, guilty people of God, so therefore it's not a contradiction, it's saying now I place the Jews in the same position I did the Gentiles, and now all are guilty before God, and every mouth may be stopped. So that's, it's not a contradiction, it's just a conclusion to it. I've already put the Gentiles there. I've already showed you that they were guilty. Now I'm showing the Jew is also guilty. Okay? Because notice verse 20 now. Therefore by the deeds of the law there shall... How much flesh be justified? No flesh be justified in sight. And now we give the answer. For by the law is what? The knowledge of sin. So the third principle that most people believe is the law was given to help you and I to be good. But in God's word it's just the opposite. The law was given to show you and I that we are guilty, totally bad. And that's what Israel never understood. With that. So God is putting that position. The law was given, it says here, for the knowledge of sin. What else does it say about the law? The law, Galatians 3.19 says, the law was added because of discretions. Okay? The law was added. Let's go there. Somebody read Galatians. Hold on to there and go to Galatians 3.19, please. And see very clearly what Paul says there in Galatians. If somebody will read that, please. Wherefore then serveth the law, it was added because of transgression. Okay, that's, that's all I need to know. Yeah, the law was added because of transgressions. So it wasn't there to make ourselves good. It was to show that we were bad. It was added because of transgression. Okay, what is another verse? Go back to, uh, to, go back to uh, Romans and go to Romans chapter 5 and somebody read verse 20, please. And you'll see another reason why the law was given. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. I love how Paul is always using contrast. He says very clearly there, the law entered for one reason, that sin may abound, that it may grow. But he says where sin abounded, what happened? Grace did much more abound. Paul's message, the gospel of the grace of God, that was given to Paul and given to Paul only. So what is another thing that we should understand about the law? We were just talking about if you're speeding and you're going faster, you may give a ticket. So is the law that they put a sign up there 55 miles an hour for those who are obeying the law? Yeah. Or is it? Well, yeah, it's for everybody. Think about it. No, it's actually there for what? For everybody. For those who... Disobey. who disobey the law because they're the ones going to be stopped you're not going to be stopped on the highway so the law is put in how do we know that? we'll go to 1 Timothy 1 9 and we'll see why the law was given we don't make a law that no one should murder somebody for those people who do not murder 
It's made for those who do, so they can be punished for their crime. Somebody read 1 Timothy 1 9, please. Knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly, for sinners, for unholy, for vain, for murderers of fathers, and murderers of mothers, for manslayers. So Paul makes it very clear. So that's the opposite of what most people think. The law wasn't made to be as good because it said it wasn't made for a righteous man, but for what? Unrighteous. For someone, for the lawless, right? So the whole concept of what people believe about the law is not true, but the problem is they don't study the Word of God. So when I was a kid, it's probably not done anymore, maybe even when you guys are in school, we had a big plaque on our school, and it was the Ten Commandments. And they put it right on the wall of one of the halls there, okay? And so most people thought, again, why is that there, though? Because that's to teach you how to be good. Well, we see from the Word of God that it's the exact opposite. So go back to Romans, please. So those concepts that most people believe along, first of all, it wasn't started with Adam or Abraham and Jacob. It was started and given to Moses. The second thing we get to understand that it wasn't made to uh, given to people to be good, but to show that every man is guilty before God. And then we know the law was given to a nation for one specific person, so that they would have the ability to go in and possess the land if they obeyed the law. If they did not obey the law, what did God do to them finally? There was consequences. Certain degrees, Leviticus says, a thing, and what was the final degree? God would take them where? Out of the land and they were never able to keep the land. That's when Christ came to this earth. Who was in charge of the land? The Romans. They were under their control. That should have never happened. Okay. Now let's go back, please. So now is what is Paul going to give? Paul doesn't leave us there. Paul gives us an answer from Romans 20, uh, 3.21 to Romans 3.28. And we're going to look at each verse very clearly. Paul doesn't leave us all guilty. He gives us an answer to the conclusion here. But now, well, Paul says something must be true at immediately at this time. So we know in God's Word, every single verse in God's Word is either in time past, has to do with in time past, or it has to do with but now, or it has to do with the ages to come. Every single verse has to do with one of those three things, in time past, but now, in ages to come. And what did Paul say about you and I as Gentiles, the uncircumcision, in time past? We were, according to Ephesians 2, we were without God. We were aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. We were strangers from the covenants of promise given to them. We were without Christ and we're without hope. Wow. That's our condition in time past. And that condition in time past is true when Christ was here in the Gospels and was true still at Pentecost. And we'll see this in a little bit. But Paul says now something is new. Because this has to do with Paul's revelation. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested or made known, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Well, the first part, part is really easy to understand. And it's so beautiful. It's the first time that anybody's ever said this. Peter never said this. Christ never said this in earth. The Old Testament doesn't say this. John doesn't say this. James doesn't say this. But now the righteousness of God without the law is made known. Right now. But the problem is the second part. What does he mean then? Being witnessed by the law and the prophets. For a long time this confused me, and I'm only going to give you what I see. You may see something different, and if you study it and can show me, you'll say, Galen, you were wrong. And that may be true. But when I look at it, it's very clear if you look what was taking place before. For 1500, what was witnessed by the law and the prophets, for 1500 years, God put Israel under the law. And the prophets talk about that. And what was the conclusion of that? That no one is righteous, no, not one. 
that the law could not save them. That they were all guilty before God. There's nothing wrong with the law. It's the rightness of God. The problem with the law is mankind. We're all sons of Adam. And that's what Israel didn't understand. The Pharisees, when they said to God, we're sons of Abraham, they forgot one important thing. They were also the sons of Adam. So therefore, they did not consider themselves a sinner. So what is witnessed by the prophets is the 1500, when I look at it, I'm giving you what I say, is the 1500 years that he placed Israel under the law. Because he said that in verse 3, chapter, or verse 1 of chapter 3. What advantage hath the Jew? Or what profit is there of circumstances? Much every way, chiefly, because unto them were committed the oracles of God. So for 1,500 years, the, the law and the prophets are proving that Israel could never keep it. That's why Paul adds that thing there about, he said, it's witnessed by because all you have to do is go back to the Old Testament to realize that Israel could never do it. So let's continue now. Look at verse 22 now. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe. Why is our King James Bible so important? Because if you go to almost every other translation, they will change that faith of Christ to faith in Christ. Well, what is believing? That's faith in Christ. So he would just be given something double there. So the answer is, remember I said that there's two kind of faiths. Who remembers what I said there's two kind of faith? Subjective faith and objective faith. The faith of Christ is subjective faith. It is Christ's worthiness to be believed in. Can we trust in Christ and his accomplishment? That's what the faith of Christ is all about. And it is used in God's word. We have the faith of God and we have the faith of Christ. So the faith of Christ is his worthiness to believe in. Our objective faith is to believe in Christ as our Savior and his accomplishments and what he did in complete a work at Calvary. That's our belief. That's our objective faith. Paul also talks about the faith in Galatians. And what did we say? We, the faith is Paul's gospel. When Paul talks about the faith, he's talking about my gospel. The revelation from Jesus Christ that was given to me. So we have the objective, subjective faith of Christ, which is his worthiness to be believed in. And our objective faith is to place our faith in Christ and what he accomplished at Calvary. The faith is the special revelation, when I look at it, that was given to the Apostle Paul. Okay? So now he says, the faith of Christ unto all and upon all them that believe. If we would have the faith in Jesus Christ, you would just be repeating it again then, because faith in Jesus Christ is believing. So he wouldn't have had to add the second part. He would just says, even the righteousness of God, is, which is by faith in Jesus Christ, period. You wouldn't have to add unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. Do you see what I'm saying? That's why our Bible, the King James Bible, is so important that we use the right Bible. Now, what is his conclusion again in verse 23, if somebody will read that? For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So again, he makes a statement here. We need the faith of Christ, and we have to believe in that, but he wants to make sure we understand something. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. No one is righteous. No, not one. Now, there's something that seems contradictory if you go to Luke 15, 7. If you'll go there, please. If you go to Luke 15, 7, there is something that is, I want, as we get there, please hold on to Romans. If you can, please. But go to Luke 15, 7. And unless you understand God's word, this could also confuse you. So if somebody will read Luke 15, 7, please. I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth, more than over ninety and nine just persons which need no repentance. Well, would a just person be a righteous person? Yeah. Yeah. But wait. 
Huh. I thought he said no one is good, no one is righteous, no not one. Well then how can he say over 99 just person need repent? What you have to understand is who is he talking to? Well he's talking to Israel but here specifically go to verse 2. And the Pharisees and scribes, right, murmured. So he's talking to them, correct? So what he's saying is, he's being sarcastic. That's what he's saying. You people who think you are righteous because the just, the 99 righteous people he's talking about are self-righteous people. And that's what the Pharisees were. So we know that he said, no one's righteous, no, not one. So we have to have an answer to why God would say to the 99 just people who don't need repentance. And repentance is simply what? Change of mind. It's not confessing sins, it's change of mind. So very clearly here, we understand what he's talking about in the statement. So go back here. Now what the answer is going to be so beautifully is 24 through 28. In verses 24 through 28, Paul is going to give us an answer that we, if we just stopped at 319, I would be going, I have no hope. And you should be saying, I have no hope. If all are guilty before God and no one's righteous, well then how can I get to heaven and be with the righteous God? But in 24, he's going to so beautifully answer that. Because sometimes we make salvation so complicated you have to go forward. You have to repent of your sins. You have to give your life to Christ. You have to dedicate your life to Christ. As Billy Graham used to say, that all that God called, he called openly. If you're not willing to come forward and acknowledge him, he won't acknowledge you. That's not salvation. Remember I said, faith is simply believing, and believing is simply taking God at his word. So if that's true then all we have to do is believe verses. That's how simple. I have to believe the verses. So go to verse 24. I have to believe Romans 3.24. Somebody will read that, please. Being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. That's what I have to believe. I have to believe Romans 4, 5. To him that worketh not, but believeth on him who justifies the ungodly. His faith is counted as righteousness. I have to believe that verse. I have to believe Ephesians 2, 8, 9. For by grace are you saved through faith and not of yourself. It's a gift to God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. I have to believe that verse. I have to believe 2 Corinthians 5.21 For he, God the Father, hath made him God the Son to be sin for us who knew no sin so that we might be made the righteousness of God in Christ. I have to believe that verse. I have to believe Ephesians 1 that I've been accepted in the beloved. Why? Because I have redemption, I have redemption through his blood the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. I have to believe that verse. See, it says that Christ, go to, this is so important to understand. Christ is the Savior of everyone. That's what people don't, it's so, they, people don't believe that. They think that he's only the Savior of the believers. Go to Timothy. I wasn't going there, but I, I hope I can find it real quickly. First Timothy 4, I think it is. Yes. If somebody will read First Timothy 4, verse 10, please. And this will help us to understand when I said faith is believing and believing is taking God at his word. Somebody read that, please, 410. For therefore we both labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God who is the Savior of all men, especially of those that believe. Isn't that beautiful? He's even sa the savior of all that are not even saved today, that are lost. But he said, especially to those who what? Believe. And what is belief? Taking God at his word. 
So salvation is simply, I believe all those verses. I believe I've been justified freely by God's grace through the redemption in Christ Jesus. I believe that I've been justified by his blood in Romans 9. Therefore, there's no wrath for you and I. I believe that when we are an enemy, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son. Then being reconciled, I shall be saved through his life. What life? His resurrected life. I believe Romans 4, that Christ was delivered for uh, 25 for my offenses, and he was raised for my justification. Therefore, Romans 5, 1 says, being justified by faith, we have what? Peace with God through Jesus Christ our Lord. We're believing those verses. That's the first great benefit I see in our salvation. And what greater benefit could there be that you and I have peace with God, and that's eternal peace. Not just for a little while. Therefore, the next verse says we have access into his presence. Did Israel have access into God's presence? Absolutely not. What was uh, placed before the Holy of Holies? A veil. And where was it split? A Calvary. But who was the only one that could go into there? And how many times a year? And he had to carry what with him? Blood. And he had to pour it on the what? Mercy seat, which is a type of Christ. But we have access into the presence of God because of simply having faith in God's Word. Okay? Let's go back to Romans. So in Romans chapter 3 now, 24, I said, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that's in Christ Jesus. 25 is so very important to understand right division. So re listen carefully as I read. Whom God set forth to be a propitiation, propitiation, that's a full satisfying sacrifice, what he did at Calvary, his cross work, through faith in his blood, there it is, to declare his righteousness for the remissions of sins that are past. To declare his righteousness for the remission of sins. This is why right division is so important. Right around that verse, you should put Acts 2.38. Because we're going to see the contrast. Remember what he said. It's the righteousness of God. What? To declare the, uh, God's righteousness for what? The remission of sins. Did Peter say that at Pentecost? Go to Acts 2.38. People who try to put the body of Christ at Pentecost and think that's the start of the church, then Peter should have said that. He should have said that everyone there at Pentecost is justified by his blood. But he accused them of cru crucifying him. You have crucified this Lord. Peter, what should we do? Well, you have the righteousness of God for remission of sins. Is this what Peter said? Somebody read Acts 2.38. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remissions of sin and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So is repenting and being baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus for remission of sins the same thing as having the righteousness of God for the remission of sins? I don't think so. People don't want to study. That's why we have a few people here and there are thousands worshiping God and praising God and getting their emotions filled and they have no knowledge. They sit there and have no knowledge of the Word of God. Rightly dividing is contrasting. Paul says, when is this being stated that it's his righteousness for the remission of sins? Paul says, it's now. But now. To declare his righteousness. Now, go down to the next verse. Notice what he says. To declare, I say, where? At this time. But now, at this time. Not in time past. But now, at this time. Paul says. I love it. His righteousness. Why? Here he gives the result that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. He cannot just forget about sin. Sin had to be dealt with. See, if it was what most people think, well, I'll just ask God in my prayers to forgive me for what I've done and he'll forgive me. No, 
because sin would not have been punished then, would it? And it was punished through one man who took our place, Jesus Christ. He was punished. So we have the full assurance that sin was fully paid at Calvary by Jesus Christ. But it wasn't proclaimed there. It happened at Calvary, but it wasn't proclaimed till you get to Paul. That's what he's saying. I declare at this time, let's read it again. I say at this time, his righteousness, God's righteousness, that he might be just and justify him which believe in all. And what is the purpose? Because if it had, if salvation had anything to do with works, I would not want to be in heaven because what would people be saying? I want to tell you why I'm saved. I want to boast about and see if you can compare your works with mine. I gave $100,000 to charity just in one year because I love men and I wanted to help them that had much, much. I did this, I did that. I was so good to my wife. <laughs> I was the perfect husband. I don't think there is one. <laughs> you ladies will attest to that. Okay, Patsy would attest to that. In, in my defense. So it's so beautifully staying there, no one can boast. Because the only thing you and I can boast about is the righteousness of God that we have in Jesus Christ as a free gift. Isn't that beautiful? So what's Paul's conclusion in verse 28? Therefore we conclude, I love this, that a man is justified by faith, and what's the next part? Without the law without the deeds of the law. That is so beautiful. Was this ever stated by Peter? Or John? Or Paul? No. Because go to, uh, to go real quickly to, uh, to uh, Acts 13, 38 and 39. Again, this is the first time Paul did, Peter did not declare this a Pentecost. Not till you get to Paul. And remember when what's taking place in, in Acts 13, Paul is in a synagogue. He's talking to Jews here. He's talking to Jews in Acts 13 in a synagogue. And somebody read Acts 13, 38 and 39. He tells us something to the Jews that they never understood before. Somebody read that please. Be it known unto you therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sin. And by him all that believe are justified from all things, from which he could not be justified by the law of Moses. That's the first time that's ever stated. And you can't find Peter, James, or John, or Christ in gospel ever saying it. Because Christ said, I did not come to what? Destroy the law, but to what? But Paul says very clear, he nailed that law to the cross because it was against us. It was contrary to us. Colossians 2.14. He had to take it away. What does 2 Corinthians 3, 7? The law is glorious, but it's a condemnation of death, and it's a condemnation of... Uh, I'm sorry, it's a <laughs> ministration of death and a ministration of condemnation. But we have a ministration of righteousness, he said, which is more glorious, and a ministration of the Spirit, because the Spirit is the one who has baptized us and placed you and brought us into union with Jesus Christ. So we have the ministration of righteousness and the ministration of, of the Spirit. But the law is a ministration of condemnation and a ministration of death. But yet he said it was glorious. But it had to be taken away because it's the rightness of God. And you and I cannot attain that by obeying the law. So now what's the conclusion? Go to Romans 8. Hopefully we can get this concluded. But there are a lot of people who are saved and have accepted Christ as their Savior, but they do not believe in eternal security. That's why they confess sin every night. They're so worried. If I don't confess it, maybe I'm going to lose my salvation. So if you go to Romans 8, Paul's going to make four conclusions to know that we have total assurance in Jesus Christ. So go to Romans 8, please, in 31 through 39. What's Paul's conclusion? Because in Romans 3, he acts as a prosecuting attorney, placing all man before the bar of God as guilty. Now Paul is going to act as our defense attorney to all those that are in Christ. I love it. And what does he say about you and I that are in Christ, who have put our faith in Christ's completed work of Calvary, who we know we're justified by his blood, we're redeemed by his blood and what his cross work obtained? 31. What shall we say to these things? If God be for us, 
what? So his first conclusion, his first argument is if God is for us, then who can be against us? So there can be no Oh, no, I better go in black. Or maybe I guess it. Help me all of a sudden have a thing. Successful? Issue? CC, right? ESS? FUL? I had a blank there, as it happened. There can be no successful opposition to you and I. Because what does he say? If God is for us, well then who could be against us? <laughs> if the God of the universe is for us, there can be no successful opposition to you and I. Wow. Paul's acting as our defense. Now you're sitting there in a chair before God. The only person probably is at the prosecuting's table would be Satan. The opposition, what? He would be the only one. Okay, let's continue now. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him us for all, how shall he not with him freely give us all things? It's all because of Christ did. But now notice the second thing. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that what? So then there can be what? If that's the same, there can be no... reasonable accusation again a better look I'm having a, a thing here there can be no reasonable accusation that can be made against you and I can there? well notice the verse who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect why? it is God that justifieth you didn't justify yourself. So the second conclusion is there's no successful opposition to you and I in Christ. There's no reasonable accusation. Go to verse 34. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, or he rather is risen again. And Paul says you have been crucified with Christ, so therefore you have already died, and you've already been risen, if Christ has been risen, correct? So he says, who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather is risen again, who is even the right hand. And what he's doing, what's he doing for you and I? He's interceding for you and I. Wow. So very clearly there, then there can be no condemnation. Wow. What a great defense attorney Paul is for you and I. If there can be no successful opposition to you and I, because it's got nobody can, and there's no reasonable accusation can be made to, uh, against you and I, and there can be no condemnation. And now to go to verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? And you notice he talks about now negative things. He doesn't talk about, he says, because what would Satan be one, wanting to try to do to you and I? How do, you know it's God, how do you know God's for you if you're having all these sufferings? You lost your job. You've just been diagnosed with cancer. We have all these problems in the world. But Paul uses them as a positive. Notice that. Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? Go down to 37. Nay, we in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor death, nor any other creature shall be able to what? From the love of God which is where? In Christ Jesus. So the righteousness of God is in Christ Jesus and the love of God is in Christ Jesus. Wow. Everything is centered on Christ. And he over and over says, you and I are in Christ. So there can be no, the last part there, very clearly, there can be no, what? Separation. Separation. So Paul acts as our defense attorney here and says to those people who think they 
can lose their salvation, read Romans 8. Or the audience will listen to think, yes, I'm saved, Christ is my Savior, but if I commit some sin, I'm probably going to lose my salvation. Or if I deny him, it says he can't even deny himself, and we're in Christ. So there can be no successful opposition to us in Christ. No reasonable accusation can be made against us. No condemnation because God, Christ has died for us. He's also interceding for us. And there's no separation for those that what? The love of God is in Christ Jesus. So therefore, no charges. The gavel is put down. And he says, you're free. <laughs> you can leave the Supreme Court of God. No appeals can be made in the last. What's our last appeal here to go to the Supreme Court? And if they say no, there can be no more. Well, there's no more. We're free. That's our blessed assurance. We have eternal security in Christ the moment we put our faith in Christ and His completed work. Father, we are so thankful for this precious word. Oh, if we would just re believe these wonderful truths of what we have in Christ Jesus, that we are in Christ that we had a surgical operation performed on us. Romans 3 through 8 says, you've been justified, sanctified, and set apart. And you died with Christ. And you've been risen with Christ. Therefore, no opposition for you. No acquisition can be made against you. No condemnation can be made against you. And no separation from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. We just thank you and praise you for our precious Savior who died and paid the full penalty of sin for us. That we might have the righteousness of God in Christ. We just thank you and praise you in his precious name. Amen.